Good morning. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So I've got this theory when it comes to people getting stuff done. There's a few types of people in the world. You've got idea people who make the plans on what's supposed to get done. You've got project people who actually get the work done. Then you've got clipboard people. We don't know what they're doing there. They don't actually contribute anything, but they're standing there with the clipboard, so they must be important. Three types of people. And you probably know which one you are when it comes to your everyday life. See, for me, I'm normally a project person. I like seeing things get accomplished. And part of this is because when you're the idea person, it seems to take forever for everyone else to realize that your idea is the best one. For example, when I was serving as a DCE, I had a couple ideas that I thought were great, and it took years for other people to realize that. So I served on our school board, and uh, every year at the Lake of the Ozarks, uh, we would always get a number of snow days, because the roads there are all sorts of hilly, and, and anytime we got snow, we would get ice, and it would take like three days to clear everything. So my first year there, we had 10 snow days that were called. And so guess what we were doing in May? Instead of going out on boats and enjoying the lake, all the kids were in school for another two weeks. And so I did a little bit of math, and I decided, you know, if we counted our school days by academic hours instead of by school days, we would actually would have built in about 10 snow days. We wouldn't have to make up any of these. So I threw that idea out there, and it got shot down every single time until about three years later when the local school district decided to count their days by hours instead of school days and all of a sudden it was the greatest idea in the world because now we don't have to make up snow days it's like man that is a great idea it sounds a little familiar but it's a great idea and so I had this other idea that I figured well maybe that'll just take a couple years and someone else to suggest it to, to be a good idea and uh, we were building a new sanctuary, and I thought, you know, we're Lutheran. We have a lot of people that sit in the back. So maybe we should slope the, the sanctuary a little bit where the pews are so that everyone can see. And this will be great. If we have, uh, like, concerts or children's programs, everyone will be able to see. I thought this was a great idea. But apparently, according to architects and people that know what they're doing, uh, that's a problem if you have a sloped floor and you have school classrooms underneath. I thought I had an easy solution. You put the kindergarten on the bottom of the slope, and as they get older, the rooms grow with them. I'm still waiting for that idea to catch on. Maybe a couple more years, we'll get there. You see, whether naturally you're an idea person, a project person, or a clipboard person, I think all of us, when it comes to our relationship with God, we want to be idea people. Not just that we want God to do our ideas, but we want him to do them right away. I don't wait, want to wait for a couple of years for God to realize that I'm right. I want him to work with me right away. I mean, he should be honored to be working with me or for me, depending on how bold I decide to be that day. I mean, we want God to be at work. We want him to be living and active as long as he's living and active doing what I want him to do. And when God works in ways that don't match up with our ideas, when he doesn't follow my blueprints for life, I tend to get angry, frustrated, and maybe even resentful. Here's the thing. God can handle those emotions. The issue is that we can't because our anger turns into not, not just resentment but ultimately rejection of God because he's not doing what I want. And this is why we need the stories of the faith, the stories of people that have gone before us. Because when we look at how God has worked in the past, we realize it's a good thing he doesn't follow my ideas because 
His ideas are way better. See, when, when we see the heroes of the faith, we're reminded that God is the idea person. And this is a good thing. We see this in our character of Christmas for today, Mary, the mother of Jesus. I mean, one thing that's pretty clear from Mary's story, but maybe overlooked, is the, the fact that Mary's not the idea person in this story. I mean, it's not like she's been praying for a child for years and years, and God finally chooses to answer that prayer. No, this wasn't Mary's idea at all. It's not like she was sitting down with Joseph one day, and it's like, you know, Joseph, I've been thinking. I think before we get married, I want to have a baby. By the Holy Spirit, you know, it'll be the, the Son of God, and you know, you, you better pack a bag because we've got to go to Bethlehem so that we can fulfill the prophecy. And it's not like God's sitting up there listening in on Mary's conversation, and he goes, oh, myself, that is a great idea. Come on, Gabriel, I got some people that I need you to go visit. This is a great plan. No, that's not how it worked at all. This wasn't Mary's idea at all. This wasn't her plan. God's the one that initiates the plan of salvation. It's been that way from the beginning. See, God is an initiating God. He comes to us. He doesn't wait for us to have the great idea. God comes to us. I mean, think about it. In the Garden of Eden, after the fall into sin, Adam is hiding. God doesn't wait for Adam to decide to come out. God comes to him and promises him that he will send a Savior. When God's people are in slavery in Egypt, God initiates. He comes to Moses. Moses, who, by the way, wants nothing to do with it, says, I'm not qualified. I can't do it. Don't use me. God comes to him anyway. And God uses him to set his people free. And throughout the Old Testament, as God's people rebel and they reject God, God continues to initiate. He comes to them through judges, through the prophets, and brings them his word. We see that in the call of Isaiah in our Old Testament reading for today. See, Isaiah has this great answer. He says, here am I, send me. And normally that's at the end of of the reading in Isaiah, and then we forget about the rest that comes on. So I decided to put it at the beginning and get the full picture. Because when we read that, that whole passage there, we realize that Isaiah should have asked some questions first before he decided to say yes. And I don't know if that's ever happened to you, where you get asked by someone, hey, can you do me a favor this afternoon? And so you say yes, because you're a nice person. And then you go over to their house and you realize... By a favor, they meant, I want you to move my whole house for me while I sit over here with a clipboard and look like I'm important. And at that point, it's too late to say no. You can't be like, well, I'm busy because you're already there and you already said yes. That's kind of what happens to Isaiah. He says, here am I, send me. And then what follows is the worst job description for a pastor in the world. Because Isaiah is told, hey, you're going to go to this people you're going to speak to them, and they're not going to listen. You're going to warn them, and they're not going to care. I don't think I would want to sign up for that, and yet that's what Isaiah is called to, and that's what he does. See, it reveals something important about God. Even though the people don't want him, that they've rejected him, God still sends his word anyway, because that's who God is. God initiates so the angel Gabriel coming to Mary and initiating this plan of salvation for the Christ child to be born of Mary, that's consistent with the way that God has worked throughout the story of salvation. God's the idea person, not us. And so that's why God comes to us. He comes to people who have rejected him, and he chooses to use those imperfect people. He chooses to use people that don't have it all together, that aren't qualified, that aren't prepared, and sometimes that aren't even 
willing, God still chooses them. God initiates. And what do we do? We respond. We're meant to respond like Isaiah, here am I, send me. We're meant to respond like Mary, I am the servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. We don't respond because what he asks us to do is easy. That certainly wasn't the case for Isaiah or for Mary. See, we don't respond because we're 100% qualified for the job that he wants us to do. Because no one in scripture is. No, we respond as servants of Christ because of the one who has served us. See, it's not Mary that gives us the example of service. It's Jesus. I mean, in our our sermon song for today, Mary, did you know, there's this great line right in the middle of it. It says, this child that you delivered will soon deliver you. See, that's the promise, the reality for Mary and for you and for me is that Jesus has come to deliver us. Jesus, born of Mary, is the very Son of God, just like the angel proclaimed. See, at the pinnacle of the plan of salvation, when the Son of God is on the cross, God takes initiative towards people who responded with hatred, who responded with shouts of crucify Him. See, at the cross, Jesus shows us the heart of service in a way that's so much greater than anything that Isaiah, Mary, or anyone else could possibly do. At the cross, Jesus shows us a heart of service by laying his life down, by fulfilling his own words that he said in Mark chapter 10, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. See, you are one of those lives that Jesus came to ransom, to deliver, to set free. Because of the service of Jesus, He has delivered you from the power of sin, of death, and the devil, and He's given you life. See, when it comes to salvation, we're clipboard people. It's not our idea. It's not our work. It's all God's. God comes to a people who have rejected Him, who say, I don't need you, who try to order Him around. God comes to us to save us, to deliver us, to do what we cannot possibly do for ourselves. And so what do we do? We respond. We respond with the faith that He gives us. We respond by living like Jesus. By focusing not on being served, but on serving. See, this doesn't come naturally to us because it's not our idea. It's God's. And as we see time and time again, it's a good thing that God is the idea person, not us, because his plans are so much greater than ours. See, life's better with God as the idea person, not me. Because his way leads to life, life eternal. It's a path of service. That's totally different than the way that the world works. The world works like a pyramid, where you're constantly trying to earn yourself to the top, the pinnacle of the pyramid. And then along the way, it doesn't matter who you have to push down, who you have to sidestep, who you have to... uh, take advantage of in order to get to the top. All that matters is that when you're up there, everyone below you does whatever you want. I mean, that's the model of power and success in the world. And so Jesus, the King of Kings, who has all authority, comes to earth and he flips the pyramid upside down. He inverts it so that the people who have power and authority and ability and success are meant to use that not for themselves, but to serve. See, what we're called to is actually to work our way down the inverted pyramid and be the servant of all. That's the heart of service, and it's shown to us at the cross where Jesus lays his very life down for people who have rejected him. 
the heart of service, which is found at the cross of Christ, it leads us to care for the people that Jesus cares for. And so this week, as we head into Christmas, the heart of service might lead you to reach out to someone who's perhaps lonely this Christmas, either because of a loss or because of uh, restrictions or because of isolation. And so you reach out to them to let them know that God has not forgotten them and neither have we. Maybe the heart of service leads you to generously give what God has given to you as you care for a family that's in need. The heart of service leads you to forgive that person that you can't help but argue with at the Christmas meal. And not to ignore them, but to forgive them because Jesus has forgiven you. See, the heart of service that God gives to us at the cross, it changes the way that we see ourselves, it changes the way that we see those around us. The heart of service is in you so that it can be used by you and lead you into service to those around you in the name of Jesus. See, our issue is that we look at our service, at our opportunities, and we try to compare it to those who have gone before. It's like, well, I can't serve like Peter, Paul, or Mary, or anyone else in that band. What I do doesn't make nearly as much of a difference as any of those heroes of the faith. So it's easy to think they're serving in ways that I can't, and so my service must not matter. But know that your service, while different than Mary's, is no less significant. Your service this year might be different than last year or 10 years ago or 50 years ago, but that doesn't make it less significant. Because the love of God that you're sharing with those people that you're serving, God's love is more significant and more impactful than ever. And so your service in his name matters. See, God has worked through broken, imperfect people throughout the story of salvation. And he will work through you. Just in case you think he can't possibly use you, Let's be reminded of who God used throughout the story of salvation. Jacob was a cheater. Peter had a temper. David had an affair. Noah got drunk. Jonah ran from God. Moses was a murderer. So was David. So was Paul. Gideon was insecure. Miriam was a gossip. Martha was a worrier. Thomas was a doubter. Sarah was impatient. Jeremiah was depressed. Mary was too young. Abraham was too old. And Lazarus was dead. If you think that God can't or shouldn't use you, you're in good company. You're in the company of the great cloud of witnesses who God has changed, has transformed through the promises of his son, Jesus Christ, and who God used to change and impact the lives of those around them. See, God has used them and he will use you because it's not about you. It's not about you being qualified. It's not about you being prepared. It's about you knowing the one who has served you. Jesus Christ, the one who has come and who continues to serve you each and every day. In his name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until he calls you home. Amen.